Good evening, everybody. It is um, my great pleasure to um, welcome Professor Alexander Regier uh, of Rice University in Houston, Texas. Um, it is marvelous to have you with us, even though just virtually, but uh, here you are, this is great. And when I say it is a particular pleasure, then I say this because um, our speaker, our guest, um, is um, a very fine specialist in the area of um, 18th century Anglo-German cultural relations, literary relations. Um, I think, I dare say, his, um, my favorite uh, publication of his is Exorbitant Enlightenment, uh, an extraordinary text, an extraordinary investigation into the um, what he calls Anglo-German constellations, uh, with a particular emphasis on William Blake and um, Hamann, Johann Georg Hamann, and uh, what um, Alexander Regier has achieved in this publication is that he has um, somehow corrected the uh, rather awkward impression that um, Isaiah Berlin once caused when he wrote on Hamann and simply labeling him as an irrationalist, etc., etc., and that was it. So we have a much more um, uh, dare I say it, informed and uh, interesting <laughs> account of um, Harman and Blake and their contribution to these constellations in this uh, remarkable book, Exorbitant Enlightenment, published by Oxford University Press in 2018. But um, with um, Professor Regier, we also have um, a very fine expert on um, British Romanticism, English Romanticism, um, with publications on, for example, um, William Wordsworth Poetics and uh, one study on fracture and fragmentation, fracture and fragmentation in British Romanticism, Ox Cambridge University Press in 2010. But uh, in addition to all of that, um, he has published uh, widely in, in other areas as well. And this includes, for example, and I emphasize this, even though it is not part of our discussion this evening, um, he has written on the prose, unusually enough, on the prose of the poet Dos Grünbein. So um, um, tonight, however, the emphasis is on uh, something very particular, something very special, um, namely the origins and afterlives of Robinson Kreuznach, Anglo-German London in the 18th century. Over to you, Professor Regé. We are looking forward to your talk very much. Thank you very, very much, Rudiger. Really and uh, thank you also, Jana and Kim. Um, I am extraordinarily pleased and also very honored, really, to be here. Um, I mentioned this just now in the chat before. Um, the institutional articulation of the um, interest and necessity of studying Anglo-German relations in, you know, the kind of political and, and, and academic climate that we're in is absolutely paramount. And um, the way in which the center does this, and especially um, the people who work there, of course, headed on by Rudy Gagana, is really a tremendous, tremendous beacon. So um, thanks again for inviting me. Um, I would also like to just briefly apologize uh, since uh, to um, Jan and Kim because uh, I kept um, some of the uh, materials um, for far too long simply because I had you know lots of things to attend to unfortunately and uh, I, um, I really appreciate their work in, in, in disseminating the information at such short notice. Um, I joked uh, in the in the conversation earlier about how this talk might um, shed on some uh, slightly more cosmopolitan dimensions of the 18th century in comparison to the 21st. And we'll see how that goes actually upon reworking um, and rereading some of it. I'm not so sure anymore, but I'm, I'm sure that you can help me out with that um, in the Q and A. Um, Today, I'd like to do three things, really. The first uh, is to give you a sense of the richness of the Anglo-German community in London in the 18th century and how this points us to a much larger topic of multilingualism and cosmopolitanism 
uh, that we need to consider as students of Europe and the world. The second thing I'd like to do is to expand the few existing accounts of this polyglot community from the more immediately obvious classes of the intelligentsia, the writers, the artists, and the book trade on which um, I've worked um, some before, uh, as Rudiger mentioned so kindly, to also include areas of society that are really much more working class, such as the big groups of the German refugees into London in 1706 and the later community of German sugar bakers in London. I want to suggest that we take their presence seriously, not just as a historical, but also as a linguistic phenomenon. And the imperial bells here of the sugar dimension should be ringing loud and clear. My third and last contribution um, is to invite us to think a little more about how, what the realization of the multilingual character of the 18th and early 19th centuries can do to our understanding of the formation of certain periods, the Enlightenment and Romanticism in this case, which think about race and nation uh, as very much tied to language. So how does the insistence on the primacy and the importance of language square with the multilingual reality and practice then and now? And once more, there's an obvious connection with the wider sort of political dimensions and concerns that we can, uh, that I'm happy, happy to come back to in the Q&A. As a scholar of the 18th century literary culture, I understand this BISF uh, series, especially in the context of the Center and Queen Mary and Rudy Gagana's amazing work and others, to be an invitation to address some factual misconceptions that they have also worked really hard to dispel. Um, I think we get a renewed sense of the importance of Anglo-German literary culture during that period, if we do that. And maybe both Leslie Stephen um, and Robinson Crusoe are slowly turning into old chestnuts when it comes to Anglo-German relations. If so, that means that some of the work uh, of addressing these common misconceptions is taking hold. However, unfortunately, my sense is that this is not yet completely so. And so what I'd like to do at the beginning is to return to these two authors to refresh some memories and maybe present some of you with material um, that uh, sheds a new light and you know, invites a new angle on this. Before, before turning to the titular Kreuzner of my talk, let me start with Leslie, Leslie Stephen, Virginia Woolf's father, who in 1898 famously stated that it is a familiar fact that no Englishman read German literature in the 18th century. One sufficient reason was that there was no German literature to read. It would, I, believe, I imagine, be difficult to find a single direct reference to a German book in the whole English literature of the 18th century. This is probably the most condensed and certainly the most memorable expression of what we might call the official line on German literature of the 18th century in Britain. The origin of Stephen's account lies in the Romantic period itself, was solidified in Victorian scholarship, and is still the basis of the standard accounts of literary Anglo-German history. It makes it easy to treat these national literatures as completely distinct um, and until the advent of Romanticism, and to read Samuel Taylor Coleridge here, of course, by implication, it's also a neat and radical break between those two um, conceptual categories or periods um, when it comes to Anglo-German relation. The problem with the account is that it's simply historically not accurate. I believed it too until I went into the archive, and what Stephen said simply doesn't match the historical facts. And it has severely limited our understanding of the period for a while. And I should make clear here um, that, you know, as you can see from the title of um, Stevens's essay, actually Stephen is not um, a chauvinist when he's saying this. Um, he, he takes on this official line. It's just that he produces a very condensed and um, uh, um, the most intense sort of version of it, if you like. Um, but this is not the result of sort of um, a, a, a terrible chauvinism. As I try to show over a variety of studies and publications, it's, it is that quite the opposite was true of what Stephen suggests here. Anglo-German relations during the 18th century were in fact varied, rich and complex. They involve exchanges on many different levels, economic migration, book trade, travel, religious communities, and many forms of productive exchanges um, across the channel. It is studies 
um, in studies involving Blake, Harman, the Moravians, and many others. I've tried to show how the constancy and continuity of these exchanges in both directions make clear that maintaining a clear division between German and British canons is far too neat a way of arranging literary history and our understanding of these terms. The material and figures that come into view challenge the way we do both literary history and literary criticism, and they remind us of the need to work across languages if we want to get a sense of the complexity of certain historical realities of the time. So you can see where my promised argument uh, from on multilingualism comes from. Now I won't go through all of the materials um, that would a be too long and b they're you know uh, already publicly available. But what I want to do is to show you how once we pay attention to these cross-channel dimensions, things can change quite dramatically. Um, and this is where I want to take the first paragraphs of Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, published in 1719, as an example, which framed that novel as a story about Anglo-German immigration, in fact. A, a novel whose main protagonist is meaningfully called Robinson Kreuzner. So we're back at the title, a name pregnant with meaning in 1660, all of which are aspects that have been widely overlooked. The first Robinson Crusoe, is one of the most commonly cited texts for marking the beginnings of the novel, a literary form said to signal the, the development of a new age. The genre of the novel went on to become the most influential form of modern realism, and Defoe plays a major part in this. Yet few have actually noticed how the very first paragraph of Robinson Crusoe presents readers with a significant Anglo-German connection. The narrator begins, I was born in the year 1632 in the city of York. Of a good family, though not of that country, my father being a foreigner of Bremen, who settled first at Hull. He got a good estate by merchandise and leaving off his trade, um, lived afterwards at York, from whence he had married my mother, whose relations were named Robinson, a very good family in that country, and from whom I was called Robinson Kreuzner. But by the usual corruption of words in England, we are now called, nay, we call ourselves, and write our name, Crusoe. And so my companions always called me. One can start thinking about why would you start with some, with, you know, mentioning a name that you have decided yourself to already erase. But that's another sort of, that is just one of the very first sort of questions to ask, opening the novel like that. Everyone familiar with Robinson Crusoe has uh, his or her own interpretation of these significant opening lines. We can I think of the novel as a, a form that um, takes us to Ian Watts' Rise of the Novel, to Walter Benjamin's reflections on the genre. Some will think of uh, Robinson Crusoe as a text about the formation of modern subjectivity. Um, others read those lines in terms of empire and post-colonialism, uh, or as one of the most powerful sort of articulations of the story of capital in the 18th century and the beginnings of globalization. Um, we can think of the text as a prime example of how Protestantism becomes part and parcel of the new world order and how religious belief and the structure of society, including its work ethic and morals intersect. It's after all also a story about loss and redemption. The novel, furthermore, remains the prime example for historians of the book, illustrating a new level of literary dissemination. We'll go back to that in a second. Another approach, which none of these readings invoked above pay much attention to, though, is the opening line's position of the, on the cusp of different specific geographies. Most of the readings that consider Crusoe's early life focus on the significance of his stubborn, stubborn insistence on going to sea, despite the evidence, divine or otherwise, indicating that he shouldn't. However, the first geographical crossing and sea voyage that is mentioned in Robinson Crusoe is in fact Crusoe's father's. He went from Bremen to Hull. The only way to do that is by ship, as Crusoe would have known all too well. What many critics discuss when it comes to Crusoe's paternal household is his father's suggestion to steer in an even keel, but always on land and never go to sea. Although the advice seems to be a well-meaning conservatism, it ought to prompt us to consider that Crusoe's father himself also took to the seas to find his island, Britain, before his son did. Crusoe's father is a German immigrant 
first settled on an island. Crusoe himself is the son of a first generation immigrant family. The opening of the novel insists on this Anglo-German background more than once. Crusoe's family is emphatically not of that country, Britain, my father being a foreigner of Bremen. In fact, the Anglo-German status of, of the family is at the center of the whole opening passage. Here is that first part of the sentence again. I was born in the year 1632 in the city of York of a good family, though not of that country, my father being a foreigner of Bremen. Straight away, Defoe sets time in multiple places. As he does in other works, such as the Journal of the Plague Year, Defoe sets the action in the distant, yet not too distant past of the text publication. The other major piece of information we gain from, opening, from the opening sentence of Crusoe is that, that the narrator's father is a Northern German who settled in England and quickly assimilated. The foe alludes to the cultural and religious dimensions of this process. His models, he models the figure of the 17th century Crusoe family on a type of assimilated Anglo-German household, often bilingual, that was actually factually, truly, historically very common in 18th century Britain. A telling detail here is that Crusoe Senior marries what you know seems to be a respectable, presumably Anglican English woman, um, thereby making the assimilation easier. Um, this union is a fictional instance of development that the first um, that we can really trace quite a lot in the um, in the in the archives. Um, that describes the that describe these kinds of movements um, uh, in terms of peoples uh, uh, quite well, especially in the church icons. The people, you know, continue to complain that, you know, all these Germans are being, you know, maybe uh, drawn into the dissenters' chapels too. So there's a whole religious sort of element to this. As Crusoe's straightforwardly propositional narration indicates, the immigrant background is noteworthy but not unusual. It's not sort of presented in a dramatic or sculptory way, um, giving us a sense of maybe how normal these relations were historically. Of course, this is a novel and not a field report, but if we check these historical sources, and this is the bit where you just have to believe me, um, it transpires that such a transnational move um, was nothing unusual in the first time, and certainly within the realm of a realist novel. The question then becomes, how do German immigrants in 1720s London read, around the publication of the novel, read this novel, read this opening paragraph, right? And these might include the sugar bakers, although that's unlikely that they had time to in fact read, um, that I'll talk about later. Um, how do they think about the parallels of their own condition and in fact, including their sort of the multilingual um, uh, dimensions of, of these existences? Um, was this a novel about themselves, about their own experiences too, uh, or about those of their sons and daughters, maybe? Robinson Crusoe, one of the best, first best-selling novels in British literary history, is, a, is about a family of immigrants and travelers. It must have given Defoe great pleasure to see that it was, and it still is, considered a very English novel and a very English character, representing specifically Anglo-centric values and ideas. I think it would have tickled him particularly because it's both mistaken and exactly right. It's a blatant mistake if we are quick readers and we think of Robinson uh, to be a typically English figure, sort of a la John Bull, whose national identity is supposedly unproblematic. It's accurate if we read the novel in a spirit to which Defoe would have been much more partial, namely understanding the character of England to be the result of precisely the kind of immigration and cross-cultural exchange, including multilingual exchange, that the opening of the novel describes. I'm of course speaking here about the first satire, The True Born Englishman, 1701, a remarkable poem and one of the most powerful articulations about the absurdity of speaking about the purity of a nation, precisely because globalization is already a fact in 1701. And once more, you'll see on my aim of insisting on the importance of language for nation building, but also for a certain skepticism about it is something we need to pay attention to. The poem works through the multicultural background of Britain and its, its complex composition over time and space. As Defoe explains in the preface, an Englishman of all men 
ought not to despise foreigners as such. And I think the inference is just, since what they are today, that we were yesterday, and tomorrow they will be like us. The foe does not shy away from considering the violence that the myth-making of the pure Englishman contains when he goes back to the impure origins of the national construction that Robinson Crusoe is later on supposedly carrying on. Thus, from a mixture of all kinds began that heterogeneous thing an Englishman, in eager rapes and furious lust begot betwixt the painted Briton and a Scot, whose gendering offspring quickly learned to bow and yoke the hafers to the Roman plough, from whence a mongrel half-bred race there came, with neither name or nation, speech or fame, in whose hot veins new mixtures quickly ran, infused the tricks of Saxon and the Dane, while they rank daughters to their parents just received all nations with promiscuous lust, this nauseous brood directly did contain the well extracted blood of Englishmen. The first points here are wide ranging, of course, in relation to Crusoe and his mixed heritage. It can only mean that Crusoe is a typical Englishman because of, rather than despite of, his cross national heritage and character even though, thankfully, there is no raping or pillaging necessary to make that happen. And that's a very, very, I think, an important point. It's not just a quip here. Such a reading of the novel makes us consider Crusoe as a British icon, whose character and cultural background are the result of immigration, transnationalism, and a specifically Anglo-German context. Even Robinson Crusoe's name turns out to be an important site of his family's Anglo-German mixture. And here I want to return to the um, to the novel. He presents his first maternal name, Robinson, as the traditional English part of the lineage. Kreutz's name, contrast, is straightforwardly German. The detail opens up Crusoe not just as a very British novel, but also as a very Anglo German novel. The text uses this Anglo German dimension to set the scene for its exploration of the crossings and the disruption of both national languages and their literatures. It's revealing that Defoe wrote and published essays specifically about German immigrants to London, championing their presence in Britain. It gives the fact that Crusoe is one of these immigrants some extra textual poignancy too. Kreuzner is not a random name and Defoe does not choose it by chance. The biblical corruption of words that the narrator invokes only half hides its deeper and important truth. Kreuzner is itself a variant, actually a corruption of the name Kreutzer, or Kreutzer, the TZ or Z, a word with much significance in the context of the novel. Kreutz translates as cross in all its many senses. A Kreutzer is a cruiser, a person or a ship that crosses the seas and oceans. Robinson's name is already a sign of his travels to come of trying to create a grid for the oceans to explore. And he can only do so by crossing his father, ignoring paternal advice. And Kreutzer also refers to the Christian cross, so relevant for the Protestant undertone of the novel. Crusoe is a crusader. He brings modern Christianity with all its capitalist practices across to the island. He lives up to the potential or a calling of his German name, as if by chance, though of course there is little chance here at all, his name also describes a literal intersection between these larger beliefs and the economic order that underlies them. And to make matters even richer and more complicated, a Kreutzer was also a coin, the most common unit of exchange in German-speaking Europe between the 16th and 19th centuries. We still hear the echoes of this meaning in the currency of the Brazilian Cruzeiro, a currency unit that at the end of the novel Crusoe himself uses to estimate the value of his Brazilian plantation. Quote, the value of the plantation increasing amounted to 38,892 cruzadores. There's an important um, detail here that, um, that will be sort of an echo later in the sugar uh, for the sugar bakers. Um, Brazil is the first place where sugar cane is actually um, produced on like what we would now think of as a more industrial um, uh, scale to get re-imported and then refined in Britain. These Crusadores, of course, guarantee uh, Rubens and Crusoe's um, uh, wealth uh, upon his return to Britain. 
like so many coins, the Kreuzer and the Cruzeiro bear the visual representation of a cross that you can see here, thereby marking the territory of its economic values, primarily Christian. One of the reasons we don't often think of Robinson Crusoe as an immigrant novel is because it's so powerful in sketching the protagonist's imperial ambitions, Crusoe's outward work, as it were. It's worth taking a moment to reflect on the intergenerational move across nations that facilitates this. The name Crusoe carries that move into the world and is from the very beginning marked as such. Robinson Kreuzner contains with it many of the central aspects of Crusoe's life to come, not just that, so the afterlives, which are the only legible through their Anglo-German connections. Okay, so what does this short reading sort of suggest? Um, one thing is obviously it puts, directly puts us uh, to us that there is a level of cross-cultural exchange specifically between Britain and Germany that's much more complex than we might have realized and that it behooves us to pay attention to it. Um, of course, the first novel presents only one instance, but again, if you believe me, there is plenty of uh, further evidence, some of uh, which you know um, is easier to find than others, but it has been traced by many people and uh, you know, surely by many people in this room, virtual room. Um, I think what I want to insist here is what is crucial to this sort of uh, endeavor is also the ability to you know, listen um, across languages, uh, that the monolingual construction of literary history actually gives us, that it doesn't, doesn't really get behind the story of Crusoe's name, for instance, um, which is representative here for a whole host of connections, genres, transmissions, and many other artistic forms that help define the intellectual and cultural context of 18th century Britain. Um, so I think that's sort of an important way to get us away from monolingual literary histories that never that never did quite work. Um, it's quite remarkable that we live in an age where we think we, we are, we're so uh, good at um, moving across nations and languages. And actually it turns out that, especially in the Anglo, um, uh, in the Anglophone sphere and scholarship, we um, are relatively reluctant to go back into the historical archives. Um, not all of us, of course, but you know, um, plenty of us are also now teaching, I'd say. Because um, when we do go back, we actually see some of the most uh, stunning sort of visual traces of these uh, Anglo-German connections. And I'll just uh, present you with a few um, that you, you know, we might get a flavor of this. Um, the most stunning visual, uh, I think, material traces of these connections are uh, these um, books that are printed bilingually side by side. They were produced in London for an Anglo-German audience, which was more numerous and potent enough for this kind of endeavor to make sense. So, I mean, they were printed in London, they were bought in London. That means that, you know, there was enough uh, circulating um, uh, circulation going on. Um, this audience helped to form an important and serious network across the channel and its public. And the public consumed much against later account, so remember Stevens, a considerable amount of German literature at the time, actually. So Salomon Gessner, the author of uh, the Tod Abels, um, for a while was in fact much more popular than Edward Young, even in Britain. The eclectic review writes, the death of Abel during the last half century has rivaled the Pilgrim's Progress and Robinson Crusoe in popularity, unquote. And there's lots of these kinds of assessments. Um, seriously organized ecclesi ecclesiastical and educational structures such as the Moravians um, overlapped with British nonconformist groups and the birth of Methodism. The Moravians in particular are the most important organized for force in the Anglo-German community, including the entrance on hymnody in Britain. Um, again, much of this work is done bilingually, um, printed side by side, um, or you know, we find all of this in manuscript too. There, there's plenty more, right? Um, Henry Fuseli uh, reveals himself to be far more than the painter of Gothic's Romanticism's The Nightmare, but in fact, an active political voice that translates um, and transmits works on Rousseau and Hume that are published by Joseph Johnson, read by Blake and reviewed by Georg Hamann back in Germany. Again, I've written about Anglo-German life before and it's remarkable penchant for producing unusual 
and philosophically significant figures. But I want to turn now to a group of um, people who also fall into this category of Anglo-German life, yet they don't really make it into um, the canons of most literary or cultural accounts today, even though some of them were very much on the radar, um, um, certainly uh, for people like Defoe. Um, and in fact, Defoe's writings on German refugees in London, to which I now turn, uh, provide a timely and powerful illustration of this point. Um, one simple reason for the rise of the Anglo-German community in 18th century London was simply that comparatively many German immigrants actually came to Britain. While we don't have really exact numbers for the whole nation, it's certain that the German community numbered 8,000 in London alone by 1785, a number that 15 years later had risen to 30,000, or around 3% of the total population. German immigrants, their culture, and the Anglo-German context have created, they created became an important part of the story about the increasingly heterogeneous Britain. It's no coincidence that the foe de developed an interest in this steadily more influential group that was mixing with the British. Remember that he believed England to be, quote, a mongrel nation, right? Thus, from a mixture of all kinds began that heterogeneous thing, an Englishman, a diverse people whose amazing quality was to assimilate foreign influence. Earlier, I offered an illustration of how this translates into Defoe's fiction by Robinson Crusoe. Um, Robinson Kreutzner himself, a mongrel son of a German immigrant. But we can also learn something from the straightforwardly historical data and how Defoe and some of his contemporaries reacted to the actual German immigration to Britain. 1708 and 1764 arrival of two large groups of Germans in London serves as a useful barometer for the increasing size and importance of the Anglo-German context in Britain, as well as the British reaction. We can see how quickly German integration proceeded and how much Anglo-German culture became a part of everyday life in London. In 1709, Defoe published an essay entitled a brief history of the poor Palatinate uh, refugees lately arrived in England. The piece helps us to appreciate how the influx of Germans, many of them economic refugees, prepared the ground for a complex Anglo-German cultural context. The direct material cause for the first essay is the arrival of between 13,000 and 15,000 Germans in London in a matter of weeks. Most of these were immigrants whose eventual goal was to reach the Americas. In the meantime, they were housed, or rather they housed themselves, in what we now would consider refugee camps east of the city. London and its inhabitants debated what to do about them, and Defoe's essay joined other publications discussing this Anglo-German influx. Again, the archive actually there is really quite broad. Much as in his other essayistic work during this period, Defoe's brief history champions social and economic li liberalism with a view that England is a multilingual and international space. The history is a passionate defense for the free labor movement and the trust in economic prosperity that it will produce. In the most general terms, the first history makes an argument about the economic, ethical, and cultural advantages of migration. In this specific case, the first argues that the character of these German arrivals in particular will not only help them assimilate, but also in fact, will have a positive effect on the British workforce. Defoe is not just international in his argument. He also brings a comparative practice to his reading and writing. At a crucial moment in the history, he refers to the scholarship in German, a printed relation in the German tongue, or to, re or to related legislation, quote, late act of naturalization of foreign Protestants to bolster his argument. Defoe's reading of foreign sources on economic migration was by no means something as special or far-fetched for this time. Just as his prose style and his political argument suggest, the crossing of linguistic barriers through print, travel, and other forms of exchange was just a part of a new reality for an increasing number of people, certainly in Europe. In this sense, the first essay is a testament to the internationalization of the argument of economic liberalism and the immediate impact such views have for the reality on the ground that these German migrants will experience in London. Defoe mentions a moral imperative to provide shelter for refugees from religious persecution, but in the end, what is most important for him 
are the practical reasons to welcome these immigrants as beneficial and productive members of society. And there's a linguistic, again, component to this that we'll see. It's a familiar argument, right? Poor immigrant laborers, as long as they're well behaved, are likely to work harder than the native population and thus will serve as an encouraging example to the English poor. That's, I mean, I'm sort of a Mickey Mouse version of the argument, but it's there. Once resettled, the integrated arrivals will generate work in business in the rural and unproductive parts of the country, or as it turns out, in London as sugar bakers. Finally, after their naturalization, maybe over a generation or two, read Robinson Kreuzner, the sons or grandsons of these immigrants will be an integral part of the country and for Britain, a crucial help towards its expansive colonial practice. Defoe intimates that it would be best to preserve the efficient and productive German character of the migrants and at the same time make them part of the English imperial ambition. Okay, obviously, the political implications of Defoe's views regarding migration are not uncontroversial. Plenty of scholars today would be skeptical about Defoe's simplicity of his economic liberalism or the celebration of free movement of labor. Historically, however, such criticism was formulated in terms of national self interest. And for instance, the political pamphlet that you have here, um, the Palatine's Catechism or a true description of their camps at Blackheath and Camberwell in a pleasant dialogue between an English tradesman and a high Dutchman in 1709 dramatizes the events around these refugees in fictionalized conversations. The dialogue ultimately takes a very dim view of the new arrivals. There is clearly um, a, an awareness, though, that this is a discussion about the internationalization of Britain that needs to be had. Um, and thus also to think about the nation's place in a wider European and global context. It's remarkable, of course, how very prescient these publications seem in today's world. Part of Defoe's, if not Kreutzner's Anglo-German afterlives is a translation and a 2017 publication of the brief history, but in German. At the height of the refugee crisis, Kurze Geschichte der Pfälzlichen um, Flüchtlinge is indeed, as the advertisement sticker suggests, von erschütternder Aktualität, of harrowing actuality. That, of, that all of this happens right after Brexit adds also to uh, adds a, another, at least one dimension. I'm pretty sure I'm not the only dual UK and German citizen here for whom these lines are prescient while rereading Robinson Crusoe in the luxury of a research library. What's also worth mentioning here is that there is currently a German edition of this text, that the one that you see on the screen, uh, in an affordable paperback, but not an English one. If we're thinking about the transmission of ideas and intellectual climates, this is not an insignificant detail. Even without insisting on the timely 21st century nature of these texts in their different status in Britain or Germany, it's clear that neither the arrival of these economic migrants nor the first brief history are isolated events. The arrival of these Germans in 1708 was a sign of what was to come. Throughout the first half of the 18th century, German immigration to London continued to grow and with the Anglo-German and with it the Anglo-German community. And over time, this helps to create a completely different you know, set of facts on the ground. Um, there's a big uh, um, wave in 1764, um, uh, another wave of German immigrants, um, which get integrated in very, very different uh, ways and much, much more uh, efficiently, actually. And I'll, you know, leave that bit out. But I think, you know, you'll again, if you go into the archives uh, in the 18th century, you'll find a, a whole different also institutional articulation of how to respond to these. The German communities have already formed and they're very interested in making this into an Anglo-German, not just a German response in London, but an Anglo-German response that can absorb these, um, these new arrivals. And of course, their linguistic practices and the books that they bring with them, the songs, the literature, etc. cetera. Um, so, I mean, here is one example that you have, uh, which is the proceedings of the committee appointed for relieving the poor Germans who were brought to London and they're left destitute in the month of August, 1764. Um, a, a great, great uh, sort of source for all of this is Graham Jeffcoat's um, Deutsche Drucker und Buchhändler in London, uh, which um, was published uh, several years ago. And it's an absolutely invaluable, fantastic 
uh, resource for um, finding uh, not just the bilingual publications, but also um, tracing um, the, the different sort of intellectual uh, um, groups uh, and individuals um, that, that keep this conversation going, not just in terms of writing it, but also in terms of actually producing and disseminating um, these materials. But then there is the other part, right? The people who are they are not writing and they're not reading necessarily because they're working um, in 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 other in other areas of multilingual London. And I'd like to just quickly um, turn to these before finishing. Um, we might ask ourselves uh, how these multilingual Anglo-German communities how that absorption work into London worked in practice. And uh, I'd like to highlight some research here that might be familiar to some historians, but I don't think has entered really a discourse of literary studies very much with the exception of um, Thora Barlow's excellent work. Um, the afterlives of these migrants and all the Robinson Kreuzners among them was manifold, of course. Some successfully immigrated to the Americas, others went up north to work in Leeds or Liverpool, and some might have taken to the sea and even found their islands elsewhere. Still others, though, stayed in London and began the kind of families that Robinson's father would have headed, though not in the middle classes. Of those German immigrants, many became sugar bakers, a profession that is mentioned in passing, but has rarely elicited scrutiny. Sugar was a brutal, sugar baking was a brutal business. It was the work that, quote, even the Irish would not do. It's worth thinking about the fact that many of the Germans who did this work were incredibly destitute, worked up, up to 18, 18 hour days and often roomed together. Fresh off the boat, quite literally, they would have formed relatively stable German linguistic communities that were part of a multilingual London of the working classes. My point here is that we should continue to push for a polyglot study of 18th century London, but one that reaches further than the intellectual and artistic classes, such as Fuseli, Bordemar, or Breitinger, to one that also includes these lumpenproletariat professionals. There are lots of reasons for this, not all of them necessarily obvious. The first is about simple historical accuracy. These communities exist. Knowing about them gives us a fuller picture of the historical situation and cultural landscape. The second is that they allow us to see what that the multilingual world of the 18th century, of 18th century London, is a much deeper and wider phenomenon that scholarship has hitherto understood. That means following the wider suggest, suggestive and interpretative dimensions of these professional, sorry, of these professions themselves too. And that is where the actual context, the specific context of sugar baking is tremendously important. Not only is this a form of labor that is almost insanely hard and exploitative, it is also caught up in a wider political machinery of empire and more global export of exploitation. As the database maintained by Brian Moore and, Anglo, and the Anglo-German Family History Society details, we need to revise thousands of names, location maps, transcripts, and other materials in this process. Walter Stern notes, um, quote, that one of the most striking features of any list of sugar refineries of the 18th century is the prevalence of German names. The English Christian names of many of them, the masters, were British born sons of immigrants. In other words, they would be very much like a Robinson Kreuzner. Sugar was first cultivated on Brazilian plantations by the Portuguese. I mentioned this earlier and paid for, of course, by those famous Cruzeiros, and many of these sugar bakers came specifically from Bremen, like quotes, uh, senior did too. In Peter Towney's study, we read a period source that, quote, for half a century, there has been a trail of young people leaving the right bank of the visa to go to London. It is the city of Bremen, of course, that lies at the banks of the river visa. Once the raw sugar arrived from abroad, now of more the West Indies than Brazil, it was transported, transported to the refinery, as Cora Barlow actually you know, points out in her, as I said, excellent work. And with many other uh, refining processes, there's nothing really urbanly refined about this at all. The sugar was boiled, and then it was mixed with lime water, to which was added a substantial amount of cow's blood. Yes, sugar in London was not vegetarian, let alone vegan, 
The blood, by the way, was called the spice of the melted sugar. And according to the 1861, the useful arts of and manufacturers of Great Britain, um, we find here a sort of description, the serum of watery part of the blood consisting chiefly of albumin, of which white egg is a familiar example, becoming curdled by the heat and entangled most of the impurities floating in the solution, raised them to the surface in the form of a thick scum, which was carefully removed. This process was sometimes repeated two or three times with fresh quantities of blood and from the scummings, a low quantity of sugar was afterwards obtained. But there are plenty of descriptions of sugar baking and unspeakably hard labor conditions that these German immigrants were laboring under. What I want to em emphasize is that much of this work would have been happening in a multilingual space and sphere. A steady stream of German immigrants would meet the second generation nationalized British subjects of German extraction, creating a multilingual sphere that was far away from the translations of Winkelmann or Montagu that, that Fuseli produced, and yet still shares a polyglot nature. What I want to suggest is something I think I missed in my earlier studies. We do well to understand London's multilingual character, not just a phenomenon not, not just as a phenomenon that produces cultural capital. While that is undoubtedly true, and it remains what, of, of the most utmost interest to me, we need to also understand how much the Anglo-German intelligentsia would have actively interacted or ignored Anglo-German labor forces that were also multilingual. Take Fuseli, for instance, an adamant abolitionist. He takes up the famous phrase that, quote, slave trade is legal for we must have sugar, unquote. Surely it's clear to him that not only Africa and America, but also Anglo-German London is caught up in these rationalizations and machinations without suggesting an equivalency here, of course. Multilingualism is involved in these transactions too. That's of course not an ethical judgment. After all, learning a new language, just like traveling, doesn't make you a better or worse person. However, the specific role that multilingualism plays in the dynamics of an empire are key, especially it seems to me because what follows the 18th century is a romanticism which insists on the primacy of language as crucial, yet also links language, culture, and race in complicated ways. As Defoe predicted in 1709, over the course of the 18th century, many of the new German arrivals brought skills that made them thrive in Britain and thus helped to establish them as full members of society. And this is where the, the incredibly complex and rich sort of uh, culture of Anglo-German London um, is being produced and is the actor background to uh, uh, figures such as, you know, Wordsworth or De Quincey uh, when they are um, thinking about German, um, well, especially De Quincey when, you know, he's, he's thinking about um, German influences and Kantian metaphysics and so on. Um, so this is not just to say that uh, by the turn of the century there were plenty of Germans in Britain, but also that they had settled in ways that made them an active part in shaping daily life in London and beyond. So what's the larger point of all this? As I mentioned at the outset, I think there are at least two dimensions uh, which I'd like to suggest. One is straightforward, it makes for better literary history. The other is that we can take the complexity and variety of Anglo-German multilingual life as an invitation to do more work to better understand the larger ways in which these polyglot networks form part of a complex process that includes bright and dark sides of an increasingly of an increasing globalization in the 18th century. But alas, we can only spend one Kreuzer at a time, so maybe we can speak about this in the remaining time. Either way. Thank you very much for listening. Alexander, thank you ever so much for uh, this uh, truly fabulous and illuminating presentation and lecture. Uh, splendid, splendid. And I'm really genuinely grateful to you for this um, topic that you have discussed um, with such panache and so exciting and interesting material uh, for us all. Uh, and I think you have highlighted so clearly that um, looking at Anglo-German cultural relations can't happen, absolutely can't happen without the 18th century and especially the first half of the 18th century where we tend to look more towards the second half for obvious reasons. But um, 
The other thing that you have introduced uh, here, I think so importantly, without which cultural history also doesn't exist, is um, the more down to earth approach. And uh, I'm particularly grateful to you for um, um, uh, highlighting the sugar bakers and um, the uh, sugar refineries. If we now all were not in Texas or anywhere else in the virtual room, uh, but in Queen Mary, uh, we could just move down to Alley Street, uh, where we have, of course, the Lutheran Church, um, St. George's, and um, interestingly enough, founded in 1762. And um, I uh, could just tell you, as uh, also a connoisseur of uh, Dios Grünbein, when we had uh, one of our first Angelmion annual lectures, Grünbein gave that, and we had actually the St. George's Church as a venue at the time, uh, because, um, as you know, just for information for the others, in case you don't know, the sugar refineries, the major sugar refineries, were in fact in that part of the world. So here we are. Um, I think it's fascinating what you told us about um, the Robinson Crusoe legacy and the background to it. So I can simply uh, invite questions at this stage. Um, and please either raise your hand and um, Jana can switch on the microphone for you or uh, use the chat, which I will now also open and I can see if anything happens in the chat, whatever you prefer. Um, whilst you're all thinking about uh, uh, questions, perhaps just a very simple, a very simple warming up uh, question from, from my point of view. Um, of course, we are talking about, not quite in the early stages that you, that you uh, uh, addressed, but we are talking about um, the early Georgian London. We are uh, talking about the Hanoverians. And mm -hmm. it is interesting, in, at least from my perception, when we looked at 300 years of Hanoverians um, a short while ago, this kind of discussion didn't really take place, at least not here. And um, what you elaborated on in, in your very fine analysis of the first paragraph of uh, Robinson Crusoe, I think is something that um, we need to take further also into, and which you've done, into the archives and see what additional material we have to, to support this kind of um, linguistic interaction, and then also to see where this utter misconception, this is where the question really uh, begins, this utter misconception we have from Leslie Stephen at the end mm -hmm. of the 19th century, where does this misconception come from? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, and again, the Stephen and the, and the Crusoe are if you work in this, right, um, and they, they have become sort of old chestnuts already, maybe, but I don't think they are really for most others. Mm. Um, I was certainly always interested in this topic, and I, and I just thought that the official line was correct. I mean, nobody really before 1790 was interested in any German stuff at all. Mm. And then you go and you find out that you know all, everybody actually learned German. A, they learned German, <laughs> which you know. That in itself is, tells you something that Byron and Shelley and, you know, and they learn German through Gessner and, and so on. So where does it come from? I, so my theory is really, or my guess, let's say, be less um, confident. Uh, it's, a, it's a curious mixture between, well, you know, a sort of a classic moment of romantic ideology um, mm -hmm. that Coleridge et al produce the moment where they retrospectively decide that you know all of these things like the death of Abel and so on are absolutely you know ridiculous and you know just silly 18th century um sort of versions of literary uh, um affectations that they're not interested in and it is only with their romantic interest in Schiller etc that you know this this all really starts so I think that's one um sort of moment and that's a self, of course, you know, aggrandizing, but also self-perpetuating uh, sort of narrative. The other reason is that 
um, I think the First World War actually changes the mood drastically in both the way and what the kind of material that people um, exposed to at universities and schools and scholars actually exposed mm -hmm. in a exposed in a way um, find and in, 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 in find themselves in conversation with it. And that, of course, you know, the Second World War doesn't make things better. So mm -hmm. I think there is a kind of a curious, uh, there's a long-term answer, which starts mm -hmm. in the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. And then there is a much shorter term answer where, you know, um, even, you know, when I did the work for Exorbitant Enlightenment, even the people were writing on this stuff mm -hmm. um, and knew and were listing things, sources, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about the early 20th century now, you know, even Leslie Stevens, for instance, he would have known in some odd way he, he's saying that despite the archival evidence staring him in the face. And there's something curious about that. And I do think it's mainly actually political. Um, yes. uh, it's a really simple and uh, unfortunately sort of boring answer, but I think it's true. I think that's a very important point because um, you are talking about a quote of 1898. And that is to say, this is the this is the time really when the rivalries between Britain yes. and, and and Germany and Germany come to the fore. Whilst yes. before you have still people like Matthew Arnold who um, absolutely you know sing a very different uh, different song about the whole thing. Yeah. But I I would certainly agree with you that this is a political decision almost. It's a cultural political decision, kulturpolitisch in that sense. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm no, I'm, I'm, I'm not really, you know, a person who does a lot of psychoanalytic reading, but it is something, there's yeah. something curious about the fact that Crusoe opens, you know, he could just say, my name is Robinson Crusoe. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no reason to give at the very, very beginning, you know, mm -hmm. where we all know the name is, mm -hmm. you know, and the word is that little preamble. Mm -hmm. In the same way, you know, what is Stephen saying? This is a bizarre thing. It's like if there really, if, if, if really there isn't anything or there wasn't anything, why are you talking about it? So mm -hmm. that's that it's a curious um, mm -hmm. sort of logic at work. He seems um, not to have uh, wanted to know about things in, in that respect. So uh, hence this peculiar, peculiar comment. Uh, who knows? Yeah. And again, I think you know, with the, with the, with um, with Robinson Crusoe, you know, I mean, these kinds of readings exist, uh, and in in some ways, just an amus bush really to get going and mm. get to understand how somebody like Defoe mm. um, is absolutely insistent mm. on the importance of these um, uh, of these traffickings. I picked Defoe because he then, you know, later on, it's a literary, literary rich example, but mm. the archive is full of this. Mm. And the interesting thing that for me, where I'm turning now is I, that I had missed was that this is of course somebody who is, and this is why Defoe is also important, but this is something that doesn't just um, concern um, people like Fuseli, right? Uh, or, you know, and other intellectuals, mm -hmm. where that clearly is happening. I mean, that that th th those circles, especially the Swiss German circles, are very, very you know, uh, sort of um, rich and active. Mm -hmm. But these other working class, this this you know, Lumpenproletariat is really a, an accurate term. If you read the if you read the um, um, the reports on the on the working conditions, it's completely crazy. Mm -hmm. And this all happens in Germany. I mean, you know, the shouting, the screaming, the you know, in those spaces, that's all a multilingual um, part of multilingual London too. Mm, and it right. is necessarily part, it is necessarily it's structurally multilingual. Mm. That is what is interesting to me, mm, that you're beginning right. to do that um, as a city, as an empire. Can we perhaps move back again and the kind of pre-George the First time? I mean, George the mm -hmm. uh, 1713, when he comes to the throne. Um, before we, I mean, you talked about, and I think this is fascinating, what actually happens before the Georgians. And mm -hmm. I mean, a great deal has happened before the Georgians come. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a sense, ironically, 
they paved the way <laughs> for yes. the aristocracy to, to come. I mean, yes. this, is, this, is a, this is an extraordinary, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, cultural historical scenario there. Because normally yep. we think the other way around. And I mean, the discussion, as I said, the discussions we had here, by and large, um, about um, Georgian England has always been because the aristocracy was here, they were Germans, so the other Germans followed. It's exactly the mm -hmm. other way around. It's, it's the other oh, way around. So you, 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 get, you, get a, you get a steady stream. I mean, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that there's, the, you know, you sort of reverse the causal chain or something, mm -hmm. but it's definitely true mm -hmm. that pre-Georgian, you mm -hmm. have plenty and plenty of immigrants. And, you know, this is an interesting thing too. Many of them wanted to, you know, they didn't want to go to Britain at all. They wanted to go to the Americas. Yes. They're just, you know, they they get there by human trafficking, and you know, it's uh, you know now happens. You know, once the coyote in Texas brings yeah. you over the border, he disappears. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, anyway, it, there is a sense in which um, they they weren't necessarily their des their final destination, planned destination, wasn't necessarily Britain. But they certainly were there. And the Moravians are an absolutely mm -hmm. extraordinary sort of bunch um, that, were, that were invested in this far, far um, earlier. And then they're, they're much, much more active than people, I think, still realize. I mean, the, one of the reasons for that is I think that the Moravian archives simply, you know, on, on, um, they, they just haven't been digitized. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to still go and, you know, um, and 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 find them in London and Leeds and you know all of these southern Pennsylvania. But what's really important is that they are there. And they are actively German. They keep the German language mm -hmm. as something that is mm -hmm. clearly um, mm -hmm. uh, part of the way in which they think of their identity mm -hmm. and their structures there. But in a multilingual way. So it's not about oh a protection of the German language as opposed to the English. So if you go, for instance, into, you know, the church archives, mm -hmm. plenty of sentences that begin in German and end in, in English or the other way around. And all of that happens, and they're, of course, part of the fabric of, of London. They do pave the way for the Hanoverians. This is not something that happens, um, I think, the other way around. It's certainly, there's plenty of traffic and openly so. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are, and structurally so. And that suggests, of course, that the England of Queen Anne was uh, was open. In, yes. In that respect. Yeah, much, much more so than I think people. Again, you know, I haven't, I didn't want to really press on the sort of the parallel with refugee streams because I think that's always a little tricky. But, you know, what are you going to do if 15,000 people suddenly turn up in Clerkenwell? Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. Um, exactly. there's not really much. I mean, even if you're not open, mm -hmm. <laughs> you've, mm -hmm. you've got to deal with it. And of course, plenty of people have, have zero interest in having these people around, mm -hmm. um, want to get rid of them as, you know, as quickly as possible. But not all, right? Quite, quite. And so there is, I think, uh, I mean, yeah, notwithstanding I, I, the, the, the caveat you have uh, suggested here that we can't compare directly, but I nonetheless, uh, Jana, I think uh, once we have the recording of this session, which um, it will be put on, on uh, online on our website at the center, I think we should send a link to our home secretary. I think it would be quite good. You never know. Um, but well, they, all here, you know. Yeah, all here, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. It is just yeah, yeah. so typical. And interestingly enough, the the um, the slide you showed about the the default uh, the default issue of uh, Defoe's remarkable, and also with the sticker that uh, you know they try to obviously mention that this is an issue now. This is a, the interesting thing about the default bit, and I I mean this is sort of maybe slightly too anecdotal, but I picked this up. Um, and I really, really wanted to figure out whether at one point that when that sticker was used, because it seemed to me, especially, you know, when talking about Defoe, who was, of course, a fabulous journalist and knew how to make money also. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is another kind of aspect that we haven't spoken about. This is not just about, you know, good feelings and mm -hmm. nice feelings about, you know, 
German refugees. This is also about selling articles. Sure. And that sticker is all about that. Mm. So uh, I don't know whether in, you know, if we're thinking about the causal relations, whether that um, translation, for instance, was commissioned as a result of already with an eye towards thinking about um, what, the, what the current political situation was, or whether it was just an odd accident. Right, that we can then somehow turn into a narrative later. Um, we should ask uh, DTV to comment, I think. That'd yeah. be, be interesting. interesting. I'd be, you know, be very interesting, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Marianne, do we have uh, a sound at the moment? No, we don't seem to have. Right, anyone yeah. else? That's a great shame, yes. Uh, or you use the chat instead. Um, right. Anyone else? Any other comments, questions, thoughts, reflections? Um, this does not seem to be the case. If if anybody has, of course, you know, I'm more than happy uh, to answer anything on on email. Um, yeah. Easily reached yeah. these days. That um, would be great. That would be great. Thank you for that. For that. And mm -hmm. and I should and I should really. Um, of highlight again um for oh ah yeah oh, we yeah. can see marianne but we can't marianne hear her is here. yes we can't hear you marianne sorry <laughs> <laughs> right okay <laughs> something doesn't seem to work never mind great to have you around anyway <laughs> fine and, yeah, and do so please with <laughs> um, yeah, Marianne clearly liked, as we all did, I'm sure your your lecture. It's uh, it really was a treat. It really was a treat, Alexander. Thank you ever so much for this. And, well, thank you um, for the invitation. As I said, not at all, not at all. And um, as we said earlier on, it will be uh, available as a recorded um, version uh, via our website. And um, with some luck, we will have you in Agermion as well for uh, the forthcoming issue. There, there might be more about sugar bakers. If that's the yes, case. wonderful. That would be great. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you, thank you for, for everybody attending. who turned up. Yeah, I really, really appreciate it. And um, you know, lovely. Again, yeah. fine. Thanks. Thank you. All the best. And, and may um, the center continue. We will try our utmost. Thank you so much. You do Thank very you. important work. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye.